uh, how many of you are graduate students? Majority. Only oh, maybe less than half. So are you in transportation in general? Uh, the topic of the highway capacity manual, quite familiar with you guys? A uh, little bit, oh, yes. OK. Those professionals, so your background was in civil engineering, or was it transportation? So you have a fundamental knowledge in this area, most of you? OK. Uh, uh, in any case, if you do have any acronym or anything not clear, just raise your hand, don't be shy. Don't assume something uh, that there's so many similar acronyms and, and I don't want to get you confused. Uh, first topic I want to talk about is the Highway Capacity Manual. This is a something uh, we call it Bible for traffic engineers. And this has been uh, very well uh, established. I'll show you some context of the history, but it is a providing uh, tools to assess uh, how our infrastructure systems, facilities of a transportation system is performing. So it'll give you uh, at least two contexts uh, to evaluate the quality of service we are providing to uh, public transportation uh, users and private car owners. Uh, we measure certain performances. Uh, for example, in the highway, we measure something called the density, how dense the uh, cars are on the freeway system, or traffic light controlled intersections, what is the so-called control delay per vehicle. And we understand that, and especially for signalized intersections, you have an option to control uh, signal settings. You could change cycle length, you could change duration of green times. On the freeway side, you don't have much to change. You could change the post speed limit that could have a higher free flow speed and higher free, free, free flow speed usually go with the uh, bigger capacity to carry around. Uh, and then there's a lot of uh, operational aspects. People do have uh, uh, something called uh, uh, speed harmonization, it's a sort of operational measures. But in any, anyhow, the highway capacity manual provides you to assess the performance of a current facility, how they are performing. And that will give us even how to invest the money to different facilities. Should we invest more onto signals, freeways, two-lane rural highways, any facilities? It's important to know how our facilities by different categories or reasons and that will give us what is needed to improve the perspective of operations. But the one key is that it's not providing policy. If you set this as a policy, that means uh, government has to invest a lot of money to meet the needs. But it's providing uh, ways of understanding it. And it's up to the local government how to make a priority to invest on. Uh, it's a big issue in, in the US, especially with the lawsuits coming up in the, I can tell you more about those when we have more time. But So that's a, the, the uh, purpose of the Highway Capacity Manual. Uh, it is a very complicated document now. It's over 1,000 pages. Used to be student read line by line to learn about traffic engineering but it's not really uh, recommended that way. Even one of the volumes is on the uh, CD-ROM or, or in the online only. They don't print the so big. Uh, this is a, a sort of a brief history. It started in 1950. Uh, back then, they wanted to understand the capacity concept. We are building, back in 1950s, uh, they were building interstate highway system. And understanding capacity is a first step to understand what is going on our roadway system. Uh, so focus was that, and then later they added the concept on level of service. Uh, it's giving A through F, F being it's just too much congestions, uh, E being we are at the edge of capacity. So we are fully utilizing our infrastructure system at its, uh, its optimal level. Uh, problem with that is that if you operate at level of service E, then it's about to break down with additional demand. So obviously you don't want to operate your system at level of service E level if you are doing planning level. 
uh, you want to be better than E, but not like A. A is just too much waste of resources. So there are just some balance of the concept. And when you open the new road, it might be operating at A, but it could go down to B, C, D. And when you have E situations, you probably need to think about creating new alternative route or possibly uh, doing operational management that could improve capacity or other things. Uh, this is up to 2010. Now they have another volume. I'm going to talk about a little bit. Uh, I don't think it's important to teach how to use each of the volume or the latest volumes to you. Understand the concept. And I'm sure Professor uh, Alkopar is going to talk about in the in Indian version of the HSM as well. So it has to be adapted to your local environment. So I'm going to talk about a level of the uh, uh, operations and concept behind these uh, tools. You have to understand why we have to update the, uh, the highway capacity manual. Uh, you may think that uh, some of the research get outdated. Uh, one of the reasons is that maybe driver's behavior changes over time. Uh, some driver, or even at the same time, the driver behaviors are different. Uh, one of the reasons they think it has to be changed is that a lot of cars are getting a lot better performance than used to be. And a lot of drivers are more comfortable with the ACC mode and others think the change in behaviors. So we need to accommodate those. A lot of vehicle mix and again the capabilities are changing. Uh, so they need to update the, the tools. And one of the key things they really wanted to capture in, in 2010 and then now uh, Highway uh, Capacity Manual 6th edition is the so-called reliability. One of the criticisms I actually personally gave to the uh, writing paper about using microscopic simulation model was when you use the, the HCM, it's only giving you an average behavior, which is okay for understanding general concept. But if you are dealing with the detailed operational level, you need to deal with a somewhat extreme case. If you consider maybe variability over time, and we know we use the concept called uh, the uh, concept of the variations using many, many measures. And you want to consider peak 15 minutes instead of average uh, one hour time. Uh, the highway capacity manual recognizes that and then understand that value to change demand to be more increased. <laughs> and to consider extreme case, you need to use a simulation to realize the variations or observe data points more often than typical average and then consider for those uh, somewhat extreme cases. And you usually target about 85th percentile or sometimes a 90, 95th percentile. So average does not give you best option. Let me give you one example. If you design left turn bay based on average flow, then it only works for half of time. Whenever you have a higher uh, demand coming in, your left turn will be overflow and causing problems. So uh, that was uh, well recognized in the highway capacity manual, and then they are adding something called the reliability measure. And this is a huge change. And to, to work on reliability, you need more data points because you have to have a standard deviation of the observations, which was not given in the previous version of the HCM. So uh, they wanted to look at the multimodal perspective as well. Uh, it's well recognized, but in the US, as you probably know, we have not many two-wheelers compared to India. Uh, we don't have that many pedestrians. So if you are trying to uh, optimize uh, any facility, let's say the timing plan for traffic light control intersection, uh, majority of the movements are done by vehicles, maybe 99%. Uh, and they're only less than 1 or 2% pedestrians and cars. If you want to optimize for personal delay, and the weights of the pedestrians and bicycles are nothing. Uh, they just have to favor cars. And when you have a cars are favored, uh, sometimes cycle length is a fairly short. And that means the pedestrian may not have enough time to cross uh, roadway crosswalk, 
the shorter green time is good for fairly low volume with the vehicles and more efficient. So how do we balance these is one of the key questions because we don't want to have a pedestrian being waiting too long. And study shows that if you wait longer than a minute, you start thinking about violating. Uh, that's why we have the uh, warrant for uh, stop control to uh, stop control uh, uh, for the pedestrians. If there's a less than 60 gaps per hour, it means a person has to wait longer than a minute. Uh, you have to put stop signal so that they can stop and you can go uh, signal the similar way. So in that regard, uh, mobility perspective of uh, analysis, uh, the highway capacity manual has a four context of the uh, measures, quantity of the travel, uh, quality of the travel, and accessibility and capacity. Uh, so these are the key for understanding mobility. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit in, in detail as well. And then these has to recognize all the mode users, not only cars, freight, uh, pedestrian, bicyclists, passengers in transit vehicles. So uh, one of the things I have personally done was uh, uh, transit signal priority. If you are trying to give a favor to buses and transit systems, and sometimes uh, people are not happy uh, if, if system is only giving priority to buses. Uh, one of the ways to deal with that is instead of dealing with the uh, vehicular delay or bus delay, you could have a total person delay. So bus has more passengers, it can have higher weight to actually uh, get the priority. And also uh, the worst case of the bus is, is the so-called bunching. One bus is so behind, the other bus is getting faster, faster, and then they go together. And that's the worst time happening. So you only have to give a priority uh, when a bus is a late for their schedule. And there's a way of doing the, these kind of things. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, considering pedestrian and bicyclist, I don't know how many of you actually have heard about roadway diet. It's a kind of new term, and they often call it complete street as well. Uh, if you have a no bicycle lane, no pedestrian lane, you have uh, like a four lane, uh, two lanes each direction with the median. And that's really uh, favoring for cars, right? And when people uh, put the idea of having a roadway diet, so instead of having four lanes, let's just take out two, one lane each from the uh, roadway and put that as a bicycle lane and pedestrian lane. Uh, and then even for median, they try to have uh, a pedestrian crossing blocks and, and so forth. So it's a huge reduction in the capacity for cars. And then they worry about car having huge conditions. Uh, it may not work for uh, roadway that having no alternative routes. But interestingly enough, drivers figure out how to get alternative route and then avoid the congestions and roadway diet usually works very well. I can give you one example. Uh, in, in, 19, in 20 something, 2010, 2007, 2007, the, the interstate highway bridge in Minnesota got collapsed. You might have heard about it. It's a bridge connecting interstate highways. And it got collapsed and everybody thinks that traffic will be nightmare. Uh, but it did not happen. Uh, people figured out, I probably not want to ride, uh, uh, drive my car, try to get a carpool and try to get a divert route. And it didn't have a huge impact as everyone expected. Uh, so that could work as well. So the core of the multimodal analysis is not about providing capacity to everyone. It goes with the demand management strategy, uh, which will have impact on cars. Uh, so that's just something uh, I can uh, convey the message later on as well. Uh, this is a, what's a new in the 2016, it's not very important. Uh, but key is that travel time reliability is now in two chapters. I mean, they are thinking really important concept. And used to be in 2010 version, they only had this into the volume four dealing with the simulation model. When you run simulation model, which is uh, microscopic, it uses a random seeds to 
uh, model randomness of drivers and arrival patterns. So it naturally gives a, a, a range of the uh, output. So you can consider variabilities. But now it's a really in the chapters and then they are recognizing this importance and try to use that concept. Uh, it's a very important for Q spillover or spillback situations. Uh, worst scenario of the traffic control is that you give a green time too long so that cars are spilled over to the intersection area from downstream link. And that's the worst management strategy. So if you understand that this spillover probability and the best option is to minimize that possibility. Uh, one way to do that is, believe it or not, people think that longer cycle length, if you understand this, helps improving capacity and then management. But when you have a spillover situations, shorter cycle works a lot better to avoid a spillover. So longer the green means that longer red for the other side and more cars are waiting and creating higher chance of making spillover uh, probability. Uh, so it's just kind of counterintuitive in a way of uh, uh, convincing the public People like to wait only one cycle instead of two or three cycles. So if you have a 220 seconds of cycle length and you only wait once, that works great if you have a really huge capacity on the roadway. Spacing between the intersections is long, then that works. But if you have a, sh a closely spaced intersections, uh, it's going the other way. So uh, uh, recognizing uh, reliability has uh, many aspects of uh, uh, managing a uh, transportation system. Uh, there are other documentations as well. Uh, the department had mentioned about importance of safety. So the highway safety manual is just something, if you have not uh, uh, seen it, uh, this is a new uh, way of uh, dealing with the safety. Uh, something called uh, the Bayesian empirical Bayes approach. Uh, it overcomes uh, a lot of challenges and issues that we practice. If I may give you a short version of this, uh, when you invest a certain countermeasure for improving safety, uh, you pick the intersections that's showing higher number of crashes past two, three years. And what we are missing there is that intersection is uh, usually showing variability over time and this was a time that unusually high crashes. In long term average, it's a lot less than what you actually observed. And when you actually uh, check the intersection crashes and then pick countermeasures, you might be picking up the intersections that's not really having huge problem, but maybe showing uh, short-term higher fluctuation in that period. And this hi highway safety manual is using empirical base approach to overcome that, that bias uh, if you don't understand, that's okay. But if you understand the new concept has been proposed and then being adopted in the U.S. trying to improve safety. Ashito Green Book, you probably know this. This is uh, mostly for required uh, specifications to assure safety. And transit has been uh, of importance as well. And they actually developed how to understand the capacity and quality of service for transit systems. It's a huge number of volumes. Uh, at least this is available uh, free uh, online on the, uh, on the, on the uh, Ashito or other uh, context. You can Google it. You can probably download it for free. MUTCD is uh, uh, one of the uh, unique uh, requirements for transportation agency to adopt onto using uh, identical uh, signs and, and uh, messages. Uh, so if you look at the stop sign, it's the same for everywhere in the world. They might have a different words in it, but it's the same red color and same meaning. So they wanted to have a uniform on this one. It also has uh, warrants for uh, putting the traffic lights. And then traffic analysis toolbox is uh, Federal High Administration's research efforts. It has a 10 or 11 volumes. I wrote one of the volumes as well. That's on the uh, dealing with the inclement weather situations. How do we modeling in case of uh, 
heavy rains or snow and so forth. So it has uh, many, many different uh, aspects of the uh, modeling tools. And again, it's uh, freely available if you want to learn more about these. So I want to focus a little bit on why we have to do uh, travel time reliability as well. Uh, situations are very different. And if you design something only for uh, average conditions, many, many cases, it may not work very well. And obviously, we design something with the redundancy. So redundancy could take up some of the uh, higher fluctuation and variations. But it's a lot better if we do start from understanding such a variability and then put that into the design perspective. And you can deal with it better. So a lot of uh, special events having issues, severe uh, inclement weather conditions, uh, crash and accident happens all the time. And many, many workers on cases are creating uh, variability in travel. Uh, so how do we deal with it is important. So again, uh, typical highway capacity manual is using annual average. If you look at day-to-day -day variations, and there are certain cases. And you probably know in the design of the highway, we use the uh, dimen uh, directional factor, whether the volumes are, are balanced or not, and also use a K factor. K factor is, so we don't want to build a road for the worst day of the, worst hour of the year. We try to target that to be uh, 30th highest hourly volume. Uh, that may be excluding all those holidays. And it's interesting if you know the 30th highest volume as a K factor, if you don't, uh, if you do, uh, if, if it does not work very well for the uh, uh, resort area. If you are going into the uh, Disneyland in, in Orlando, uh, their demand is much higher <laughs> over 30 hours. But in general, so you have to be specific for certain applications and flexible enough to consider other factors. So again, 30th is not rocket science. It's just typically, if you exclude the top 29 hours of the volume, that's something you cannot really deal with it and try to design for 30th highest our volume. Again, showing this of the variations and keeping that into the design elements is important is why they changed it. There are so many different ways of looking at this, but in general, they are looking at the percentile. Are we looking at the 99th percentile, 95th percentile, or compared to the mean, and how much uh, are we adding uh, so-called the planning time? I don't know whether I can so planning time is something that uh, commonly used. If you want to be on time and you don't want to travel based on average travel time, if you are targeting my travel time is probably average plus uh, 1.9 something uh, standard deviation, it's whatever the, the uh, Z value giving 95th percentile. So 95th percentile means that uh, one out of 20, you may not be able to make it, but most of the time you will make it. Uh, so planning time is something to understand the travel time variability and you will try to get there on time. So it's commonly used in the U.S. I need to get out of this, I yeah, guess. On the slide. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Somebody lied to me. You pay. I never use the pen. Uh. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so to, to look at the urban street, uh, uh, we have uh, added all these, not only travel time reliability, work zone has been added, new TURC methodology. TURC has a different acceleration decelerations. It's causing a lot of problems as well. Roundabout is a very popular, not as popular as India, but we're getting a lot of roundabouts and trying to update the roundabout values. As you can tell, 
as the people get educated how to use a roundabout, the capacity increases. So we want to recognize that. And one of the challenges in roundabout having multiple roundabouts, uh, we realize that it's a losing progression. Uh, roundabout is not good at keeping the progression. Uh, so if you have a major corridor with the multiple roundabouts, it usually does not work very well. And, and in the U.S., they tried it and decided not to. Uh, new planning method, uh, I can probably mention a little bit. Uh, when you design a new intersection based on planning approach, and you have no volumes and how to estimate uh, signal timing or even number of lanes, uh, there's a method that actually updated. And a lot of alternative intersections and interchanges uh, maybe prohibiting left turns and allowing make a P turns at downstream kind of things are, are getting some popular because it can provide a higher capacity to through. And the downside is obviously you'll have to uh, travel longer distance. And that might cause more emissions. Uh, so you can analyze those as well and which ones are better. So these are added into the uh, new capacity manual. Uh, you don't, these are just new chapters added in the highway capacity manual. So the new chapters, as you can see here, are fairly uh, well uh, organized. So reliability is covering pretty much everywhere. And we look at the each facility segments. And each segment, we look at the operations uh, of the intersection boundaries. And we have uh, signalized two-way stop controlled intersections, all-way stop controlled intersections, roundabouts, and interchanges, and, and uh, others, alternative intersections. And in, on separate note, we also have uh, uh, pedestrians and bicycle facilities are being considered. So the service measures are changing as well. Uh, a lot of the roadways, we use uh, average uh, traverse speed. Uh, instead of the percent of the free flow speed is being used, we really recognize average speed. And then threshold for the level of service A and B had a change as well. Uh, again, why do we change these? Uh, I had the same questions as a student. Uh, this is uh, merely consensus among the experts. And they feel like a current level of service F. So maybe if I remember correctly, 1985, 1994, they changed level of service F from 60 seconds per vehicle to 80 seconds per vehicle. Uh, 60 and 80 has a huge difference. One thing they changed was uh, previously they used the approach delay, now they call it control delay. Uh, I don't want to talk about it in detail, but so it's a consensus. It's not about rocket science of uh, uh, physics, unfortunately. So just keep in that mind. Uh, understanding Q spillback and evaluate is important. And uh, used to be the level of service was based on length of the segment, I mean, that's understandable without having data. But with the more data available, travel time is used as a weight instead of the uh, length. So making sense. And uh, again, the issue of data availability and how difficult to collect the data and then analyze the uh, level of service. So these are sort of a summary of the uh, urban street measures that we are using. Cars is based on mostly uh, travel speed and level of service letters are being used. Uh, perception scores are just recognized it, uh, but it's not really main. Uh, and pedestrian bicycles are based on the perceptions. So we look at the uh, video feed, and people do have a consensus of this is a bad, this is a good kind of things, and also understand the, the uh, uh, quality of service. Uh, pedestrians are based on uh, personal space, how big person can actually keep the personal space while moving around. Uh, bicycle case, uh, many aspects of it. One is uh, dedicated lane is available, uh, how many vehicles are nearby, things like that. So we'll, I'll show you some of those later, next, next class. And then uh, the buses and transits are also being used as well. So these are the measures used. And again, there's a, a obvious trade-offs between the, the right-of-way uh, different modes of transportation, uh, impacting modes of the uh, cars, pedestrians, bicycles, and heavy vehicles are uh, causing the performance of the auto vehicles. One example is that a lot of heavy vehicles 
uh, they usually take a longer time to uh, start up uh, because of the huge weight. And also, if there's a priority given to buses, and then also that will affect the cars, so it's all connected to each other. And we'll have to have a holistic way of understanding this concept. Uh, sometimes the people are interested in knowing how this was made. As I mentioned, this is based on the consensus. So there's a co committee uh, organized by uh, Transportation Research Board, uh, which is one of the uh, seven uh, National Academy's branches. And Transportation TRB Board is actually uh, all volunteer-based approach. So everyone, the members are volunteers, uh, except for a few staff members uh, coordinating the efforts. And whenever we have something uh, research needs, people write up a research problem statement, and, and usually that goes into the state person. A state person sees that this is an important research, and then they endorse it, and it goes into the ballot. And a lot of state employees, decision makers are, are voting on it and they pick top maybe 20 uh, topics, and then they start putting money into the, each of the problem statements, and then they organize the uh, panel members who actually write uh, request for proposal statements, and then they select a uh, contractor, they monitor throughout the projects, and once they deliver their final products, committee also reviews. Uh, this is a valid research, worthy of uh, being adopted into the highway capacity manual. That's how they do research. So again, the reliability measures and using modeling tools, uh, they were being done by research project and demonstrated that uh, we are capturing the reliability in a, in a proper way. And our simulation tools are reasonably replicating the real field conditions. So it can be used, things like that. So the, I just explained this uh, committee problem research statements, and then uh, can we come back with the uh, re final report, and then they recommend, and then becomes part of the highway capacity manual. So I kind of gave uh, a high-level overview on the highway capacity manual. I guess uh, one thing for sure you need to remember is that now the highway capacity manual is recognizing variability, uh, travel time reliability part of their performances. It's not using average anymore. So that's a huge change to me, and to me it's the right direction. Uh, next 20 minutes or less, I'm trying to uh, convince you that transportation planning and traffic operations are being separated in a way many, many years. Planners are looking for next 25, 30 years. So they are only interested in economic growth of the area, so whatever the economic board <coughs> decides that our city will have a population growth of 10% next 20 years. And with that, there's increased the trips and then needs for having infrastructure of roadway systems. We might have a more uh, industry coming in. I have something that, that planned for and then more truck tri trips and then increase the, the mode and others. How do you accommodate those in 20 years and build a new network of uh, transportation system. That's what transportation planners are doing. And traffic uh, operation people are mostly doing very short term, uh, imp improving the, the operation of the corridor. And if they are getting connected to each other, and we can see a lot better coordinations. Because uh, every year we do something, it will be affecting 20 years anyway. So. Uh, why we do have this kind of concerns and economic growth and sustainability is a key to uh, government officers. They wanted to get reelected. Their, their primary goal is reelected, right? So they want to concern about this and then coordinating with the transportation is one of the key. Uh, security concerns, public safety, congestions are a huge concern, urban sprawl, environment. So these are uh, key concerns. And as a, as a government, how do we allocate their, hopefully, uh, reasonable resources of money and, and, and staff to different priorities? And properly understanding transportation needs is uh, probably the first step to, to have a better 
uh, reallocation of the fundings. So these are all of the concerns that government has uh, in terms of transportation. Uh, planning for operations are now trying to coordinate between planning and operations. And uh, in the U.S., they are sort of started doing it. Uh, So-called the MPO is a Metropolitan Planning Organization. Uh, they are key organization for creating plan for 20, 25, 30 years in the future. And they are trying to work with the traffic engineers in the city uh, to coordinate things. At least the, the traffic engineers are informing uh, MPO people that this is our short-term improvements and then please do consider these into the uh, planning design and changes. Uh, a lot of the uh, operations are being now done. Uh, regional transportation uh, operations, collaboration and, and coordination activity. Uh, RTOCC is the way of doing, the, doing this. And again, with these efforts, uh, trying to have coordinations. Um, so it tried to address the important institution uh, underpinnings needed for effective regional transportation system management operations. Litsmo is now part of the ESHITO. ESHITO is a, a non-profit organization of entire 50 states uh, officers all together and they put the money in, try to address uh, planning, operation, Litsmo issues and other issues as well. Uh, for the entire 50 states. So this is efforts that instead of each state doing certain things, let's try to coordinate. And Ashito is recognizing this Ritsumo as a very important activity. Uh, so obviously uh, trying to do this is a reason for doing, uh, is uh, moving from, let me just skip something. Uh, if you forget everything, I, I want you to forget, uh, remember this one. So 20th century operations are so-called uh, regional and agency peak period operations. It's not really well coordinated. And usually we do have a more maintenance, uh, try to have some real time, very limited. The key words I want to emphasize is that it is based on output oriented. And output oriented, what's wrong with this, uh, compared to outcome oriented. So it seems like the same words, but they try to distinguish these two. Uh, so out, output oriented is uh, something that uh, we spend money and then now we have uh, uh, increased the vehicle miles of uh, congestion or incident management system. Our state used to have uh, uh, 100 vehicle mile uh, area to fully cover the by uh, closed caption TV on incident management and, and so forth. Now we added uh, uh, 50,000 more, so 50% increased in our system operation coverage. That's a sort of output oriented. And if you think about this output oriented, uh, do public care about increase the coverage? They might have heard about it, but they don't care. What they usually care about is outcome oriented. They care because government increased from 100,000 to 150,000, now the duration of incident is reduced by 20%. They want to feel what they actually gain by government spending money and investing things, so-called outcome-oriented. So this was a huge push by the uh, President Bill Clinton's era. Uh, there's a, a government accounting office, office was pushing uh, budget spending is not based on how many dollars you spend and then increase the vehicle miles coverage. So we added another lay miles. They don't think that's important. They think of accountability of the uh, system performance. So you spend a million, billion dollars. What is the outcome? Not what is the outcome that that public can feel it, not the, the uh, output. So this ties into linking transportation, planning, and operations. Uh, if you are thinking about planning, uh, they are usually focused on out outputs. Uh, but if you tie that into the operations, the outcomes are becoming very important measure. Uh, that also requires to have good simulation tools uh, to measure these. And also the time will tell the spending was appropriate. 
So as you actually do something in the uh, operational management, and you will have uh, outcomes that's giving the benefits. So that's uh, one of the reasons that they are trying to do have this uh, 21st operation based on uh, multi cross traditional multi-agency, multi-modal system, and trying to look at the performance of uh, outcomes, not the outputs. So what does it mean for uh, regional planning? Traditional planning versus a new uh, uh, planning uh, based on the TITSMO approach, linking the uh, planning and then operations together. Uh, used to be uh, government officers, they have a regional plan, long-term plan, and funding-wise, and they have an uh, impact on those, not based on operational level analysis, as you probably know, the planning tool, uh, they are using macro model. They don't uh, consider operational level analysis. One example, uh, most of the planning models cannot simulate high occupancy vehicle lane. Uh, HOV lane is uh, uh, allowing two plus vehicle to use a dedicated lane to improve efficiency of the roadway system. Uh, usually, macro model does not consider intersection as a, a signalized operation. They create as a penalty for turning movement, things like that. So they don't have a detailed level analysis. If you have this into a planning based on the uh, operational thinking, it can actually have a different impact. And a lot of uh, uh, decisions are being engaged with the operational managers. Uh, a lot of times, um, I'm not sure this is the case for India, but in the U.S., if we wanted to help out the uh, emergency vehicle drivers by finding routes that has a smaller variability in terms of travel time than whatever they choose to route. And then we actually show them this route is probably less variability, so when you travel, you will actually get there uh, on time because uh, uh, when you carry the patient, getting the hospital on time is very critical. You don't want to be delayed. And something we did not consider was uh, availability of a shoulder and median. Uh, those operators are really favoring to use the roadway with the medians and, and shoulders because in case there's a congestion uh, with the median, car can actually move around to give away to the emergency vehicles. If you have a roadway that does not have a median or shoulder, you get stuck. It's not possible to move around. So something that uh, managers can, and an operation that people know, and planners may not know, can be connected to each other. So this is a good thing to be considered. Uh, so uh, this will have a better impact on the regional performance of the system. Uh, what it means is that typically based on operations and management, uh, now is doing uh, again, multi-agency, uh, uh, multi-modal systems and sharing the real-time information and more coordinated and also custom focused performance measures instead of uh, typical output measures. So that's a good thing for uh, agency. Uh, again, I mentioned the difference between simple operations and maintenance versus looking at the transportation system management and operation level. Uh, it's a fully integrated and well coordinated, uh, a lot better for improving uh, regional level uh, with the better security, safety, and reliability. So it's uh, uh, something that comes with the linking between planning and, and uh, operations. Uh, many of these can be uh, uh, considered in, in coordination as well. Uh, you have seen all of these in even the highway capacity manual recognized these and they include these into uh, assessing the facility performance. Uh, so cultural shift has to be given because uh, typical uh, regional planning level, they don't have these uh, common data sharing, uh, keeping the performance measures, having good uh, congestion management systems, sharing the funding and resources. A lot of institutional uh, issues are not, not uh, trivial. Uh, I'm not sure that's the case here or not. Used to be in, in uh, traffic operations center, there's a one for managing freeway, one for managing traffic signal, urban systems. They don't talk. 
uh, obviously there are different divisions. Uh, they need to be communicating each other and coordinating. Now they are in the same room and managing system together kind of thing is important. Uh, some of the issues and challenges, obviously, again, cultural shifts as we've done, a lot of attitudes and controls. In institutional issues are many, many challenges. Uh, to, to overcome these institutional issues is, uh, in my personal opinion, putting them into the same room is the best option. Uh, one of the things that uh, U.S., especially Northern Virginia in Virginia, has done was that they have a huge traffic management center that actually has uh, police comes there, police offices there actually, uh, 911 call center is there, freeway management center is there, uh, traffic signal urban management center is there. They're all together and they are working together to have a better coordination. Uh, and so uh, these are the common uh, uh, challenges to be overcome. Uh, so how do we do this 21st century Obviously, intelligent transportation systems are key. Uh, having technology, sensing, and communications, now we can get uh, more data than we ever wanted to. With the connected vehicle, it's probably more data. And IT, so IT support is also important. Uh, getting data from local intersection to the traffic management center used to be it's a dial-up modem. You call into the intersection and then change things. You cannot really get the data from intersections. Now with the all optical network, Northern Virginia has uh, 1,400 traffic lights and they are all connected into one system. So they can get real-time data uh, uh, anytime they need. It's continuously coming in. Uh, and then uh, collaborations and then coordinations, again, the key is the one of doing that. Uh, so, uh, Awareness and uh, outreach and then development and delivery and showcase and of the best practices will have uh, desired outcomes. So this is the uh, one way to achieve a better operation and, and also this comes with the linking planning and operations. If you are continuously doing better operations only without coordinating with the planning level, that's going to be another problem. Uh, you invest a lot of money for operations now they have a new highway built in or new system comes in and you, you may be uh, overspending money. I can give you one example. Uh, this is being recorded. Uh, one example, sort of off the record, but uh, so the, the, uh, an agency actually uh, installed a very expensive uh, communication line for getting data from the each detectors. And that's a key of the uh, 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 keeping those uh, uh, pavement uh, depth to be safe. And then within six months, there was a repavement. So they actually cut the road. Um, so obviously it means that they did not coordinate very well. So they lost most of the communications. Uh, a lot of the, the efforts of the uh, Federal Highway Administration and Federal Transit Administration, they are trying to link uh, this planning and operation, and they have these principles. I, I don't want to just uh, go line by line on this one, but these are the efforts of doing, and they have actually two uh, well-known documents. I don't know you have the access to those or not. I, I have a link on this at the end of them. Uh, so these are pretty much those uh, components on it. Uh, I was going to show that one. So this is the, the two documents are available. Uh, FHWA and FTA, they're trying to have work together for making this uh, linking planning and operations. Uh, and then another one is uh, opportunity for linking planning and operation of primer. So these are two documents. Uh, are they available this slide later on or? or? Okay, so maybe uh, find these documents and use this for uh, if you can uh, as an agency level or, or even uh, knowledge for getting new job in the future and try to convey this message. Uh, if the planners and, and operations are not communicating very well, uh, there's a huge barrier and it's not something they can talk to each other. It has to be beyond that. It has to be an institutional level, policy level, they're trying to build the planning 
by considering operational aspects of it. And also when the operational strategies are being considered for implementation, the planner has to be involved as well. Uh, so that's pretty much one hour I wanted to talk about. If you do have any questions, happy to answer or entertain. Don't be shy. So you understood everything? I heard there's an exam at the last day, so I can ask anything on this one. Um, expect that everyone uh, will uh, ace it. Uh, if no questions, then maybe a 15-minute break. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Get back here and around 11.15. So just walk around a little bit, have some more tea, I guess. Wake up and ask myself. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. And I usually do not sit down and talk. <laughs>
So they try to have their own goal and how to achieve that level and also try to compare with the similar size cities and, and, and other uh, number of people uses it and how to encourage them and how to be safer as well. And also when, you, when agency uh, put the money into the uh, facility uh, improvements, they want to have some accountability. Uh, we actually did a good job of uh, spending money and then performance was improved by certain percentage and so forth. So we got to have a data for environment and also behaviors uh, in terms of uh, uh, volumes and usages. Uh, sometimes a bike is only for leisure purpose. Uh, it's a different from commuting purpose and that has to be a different way of uh, uh, understanding that, that aspects of it. And a lot of the environment as well, uh, we have a good uh, facility inventories and land use, uh, socioeconomic, uh, socio-demographic data, and a lot of uh, perceptions on the facilities. Uh, so these data are needed to understand the performance of the bicycles. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of good data sources, at least in the US, Tiger Line is a good GPS-based, sorry, GIS-based uh, data source. Uh, providing very detailed uh, quality of the roadway system and many regional uh, road data is available through MPO, as I said, the metropolitan organizations, metropolitan planning organizations, counties and state DOTs. Uh, a lot of the, this data is available by different classification of the roadway systems uh, and also uh, roadway on sidewalks and paths. Uh, it's available as a GIS or CAD, uh, or sometimes it's Excel spreadsheets. And sometimes we are really focusing on safety for school zones and, and activity locations like uh, shopping centers and some of the libraries and so forth. So we have those facilities. And uh, understanding the, the quality, uh, qualitative infrastructure is also important. Uh, uh, slope is uh, adequate for uh, disabled person, uh, do we have a sight distance and visibilities, and how long did it take to cross, and also uh, gaps. Uh, a key issue is that when we have a, a lot of cars passing through, can we identify gap that pedestrian or bicyclists can then safely cross the road? How many gaps are available? It's obviously a function of uh, number of vehicles, heavy vehicles, uh, sometimes the turning percentages as well. Uh, national sources, again, a lot of data is available from census. Uh, household survey uh, was done every a few years and has a lot of data. This is a survey given to the household and they fill out the forms and we understand uh, how each household member, uh, member travel and, and so forth. Uh, a lot of times we are getting is that uh, are we counting pedestrian uh, or pedestrian bicycle mixed traffic. Sometimes they are using same uh, facility together or bicycle alone, cars and so forth. Are we counting from the, the roadway segment or, or intersections and uh, rural path or trail type areas, uh, things like that. And uh, again, a lot of times we don't have a facility to counting permanent 24 seven. There are some locations we count the permanent station even for cars, we have locations for uh, counting entire 24-7. And then we collect the data for uh, sometimes 24 to 76 hours. And then we interpolate the data to, to generate so-called AADT, average annual daily traffic. Uh, this might be a new concept. So if you have a permanent count station that's giving data for 24-7, so you have a every hour volume of the uh, traffic or even bicycles, and there will be some variations by uh, time of uh, day and also uh, month or even the week. So maybe there are more people during weekend uh, for leisure, uh, more travel during weekdays, uh, more for peak hour, and also the monthly variations are fairly high when there's a school season versus not, uh, vacation time or not. So what uh, we use is that we have a sort of a, a factor for uh, adjusting for different time of day. So if you have a 24-7 for entire year, 
you could see the variation by each month. So if we collect the data for May, which is higher than average, then you want to look at the entire average for year, then you probably want to have a factor that making less than uh, May counts. Or counts given, uh, given uh, off-peak hour, and you want to make sure that the counts are going to be increased by have a factor to look at the variability of different time of day. Uh, things like that. So we'll show some of those here later on. Uh, and also the, the way of counting, you can use this kind of board, manually count them, and you can have a, a tube. Uh, tube is a very popular in, in U.S. It's a temporary tube and cars passing by, it counts the number of axles. Uh, so obviously more axles uh, you can actually convert. You have a rough idea of how many heavy vehicle percentage, passenger cars, uh, things like that. Uh, also video can be used. Uh, if there's a good camera and then good uh, algorithm to distinguish cars, the one of the challenges of using videos is that you, so-called occlusions, if you have like a, uh, using drone to capture number of cars easy, but if you are putting into the uh, over bridge, you still have uh, cars uh, looking like the same car, but the separate two cars, they look like the same car with the occlusions. So there's a challenge of doing that. Uh, and how do we do uh, sampling period? How do we make sure that number of sample size is good enough? Uh, so typically they do 24 to 72 hours to capture at least a different time of day, day of a week, uh, things like that. <coughs> Again, how to uh, extrapolate these data points based on daily or 24-7 uh, depends on the situations. Again, number of data points is a dip, uh, uh, depends on the, the variations of the data itself. If you have a constant congestion 24-7, you may need only one hour data. But if you have a huge variation by different peak and off peak uh, with the different weather conditions than others, you need a more data sample to have a better uh, reliable data uh, because it's a, you have to use the higher number of data points to reduce uh, estimation on your standard deviation, uh, things like that. Uh, so an example of uh, uh, making uh, extrapolation is that maybe you have uh, two-day counts to reflect for uh, so-called uh, uh, average daily traffic over a month. Uh, so you want to have a two-day and to reflect the entire average monthly data. And you usually have uh, uh, Fridays and Saturdays and others. Uh, how do we actually change them? Uh, or you can actually adjust for entire annual average daily traffic. Uh, so that will consider change in uh, variation of a month as well. So February is uh, less than average, then you probably want to have a, a factor that is bigger than one to extrapolate to be average of entire year and things like that. Uh, so it, at the bottom, uh, winter counts as a very small and summer has higher. So if a 50% and you multiply by two to make it those as a bigger, uh, things like that. So you will get the AADT. Why is AADT important? Uh, AADT will have uh, uh, average annual daily traffic, so you will have an entire average for the entire year, which will reduce any uh, underestimating or overestimating by different months. But with the AADT, as I mentioned before, we use a directional factor, D factor. So it's a, when you look at the peak hour, and if you have an unbalanced uh, by directional, and you want to have a higher volume direction. And also K factor is also looking for reasonable peak hour volume that you want to deal with for operating the, the intersection or facilities that you are dealing with. So typically uh, 48 hours for non-motorized facilities. Uh, again, this depends on variations, but that's typically being used and seems reasonable. And you have a motorized facility for AADT, or monthly, uh, average daily traffic, or, or other factors. So this is one example of the uh, factors. So if you can see here, I can, so th this is a, uh, AADT uh, average by different uh, month. So as you can see here, they are same, uh, which is a entire AADT. 
if you look at the monthly, it's a huge variations. So uh, if you add them up this all 12 divided by 12, it'll have about 1975. Uh, so it's a mistake to use data from January and without extrapolating and assume something is uh, going to be similar. Uh, basically showing the same thing as well, uh, ratio between monthly and then AADT. So bigger than uh, one is basically having, you have more than average, uh, smaller than one is you have uh, uh, less than average, you need to in, uh, in, inflate that to be reasonable value as AADT. So these are uh, commonly used. Uh, key is that the assumption goes into this is uh, uh, that where we have a full 24-7 counts, uh, the facility is similar to what we are dealing with it. So they have these permanent count stations, a few hundred at least in the Virginia, and they are classified by interstate highways, uh, local or major arterial, even with the different AADT levels and so forth. So it's, a, it's a important for you to consider that as a factor and adjust based on which is the most appropriate or similar to uh, a facility that you are dealing with. Uh, so it's very commonly used because you don't have a time and money to count for entire year, obviously. Uh, crash data is also important. Uh, there's uh, many sources of uh, crash data, and some locals are interested in number of uh, crash frequencies, crash types, crash rates. So the number of crash is uh, different than crash rate because if you have a low uh, flow uh, road, and number of crash might be small, but it's very significant. Uh, if, if you have a, a roadway with a high volume, uh, number of crashes might be uh, high, but the rate might be not that high. In other words, you have 1,000 cars, you have a 10 crash versus 100,000 cars with having 150. You cannot simply compare number of crashes. You should consider with the crash rate as well. And also look at the trends over time. And crash locations are important. So this is a typical uh, police report. And in the U.S., police report is uh, done by, obviously, the, uh, those who got into the crash and police. They tell police that this is what happened, and they sketch and then jot down things. Uh, these are not very accurate, though, but this is what we get. Uh, hopefully, uh, in the future, we have a better accurate data by insurance companies or, or OBD data and other sources, but this is what we get. And we identify data by uh, different uh, locations. So we are interested in different types and characteristics. Uh, when we are dealing with safety for bic bicyclists and pedestrians, uh, we only want to have a vehicle crash with the pedestrian bicyclist. We don't need a crash for uh, multi-vehicle crash and others. So, so you want to screen them. And you want to also look at the hotspots. Uh, with the GIS, and then you can have a uh, size of this circle indicating number of crashes or indicating different crash types and so forth. So it's a way of screening and filtering data using GIS techniques. And then we evaluate the, the uh, data based on level of services, uh, traffic flows and densities uh, through the uh, letters uh, using the highway capacity manual and uh, we have the, some of the measures available for traffic, uh, bicyclists, pedestrians, or separated. Uh, so that's uh, the, where we uh, have right now. Uh, some of the examples of uh, showing the, the quality of service for walking. So if you are walking in, in very harsh environment, covered with the snow, this is probably not very good environment. If you have a really well uh, organized sidewalks and uh, separate bicycle lanes, this is probably good uh, level of service. But how do you recognize these? And we got to have a common uh, way of assessing these uh, level of service. So that's the key. So we want to have a level of service that's a consistent, uh, systematic evaluation for existing conditions. So anyone can see this is a level of service A, B, C, D, E, one of those, and consensus on it. Uh, and uh, so results in terms of uh, transportation professionals and public can easily uh, uh, recognizing, oh, that's probably okay. Uh, and then objective way of identifying the needs and, and priorities for improvements, because we can identify uh, out of uh, 40,000 segments of the 
uh, bicycle lanes, and which ones need to have improvements. Uh, you don't want to go one by one and, and uh, subjective way of assessing it. It's better to be objective way of identifying these are the level of service worse than E, and we got to do something about it. And another important aspect is that what aspect do we change and, and we can improve? Uh, certain things is that do we have a, a longer, wider width of the bicycle lane? Can we do that? Or can we have some way of uh, uh, reducing uh, heavy vehicles on the road so the bicyclists are safer? So improving uh, performance, performance of the bicycle lanes. Uh, or or uh, adding another one on the other side and then separating those two movements. Uh, can we do that? And things like that. So the, the measure, if we have that as an equation with the certain factors, then we can play with it, try to make a better performance, if that makes sense. I, I have actually an example for that. Uh, this one is uh, based on the 2010 uh, Highway Capacity Manual. Uh, we're also looking at the multimodal uh, analysis as well. And uh, very details, expanded the pedestrian uh, on the pedestrian and bicycle facilities, and also include the transit chapters. And these facilities are part of urban streets. So so-called complete street. Uh, complete street is not a way of uh, completed street. Complete street is a way of uh, including multimodal aspects of it. Uh, we usually look at the, the urban street as a car and maybe heavy vehicle buses. Now they recognize this is also used by bicyclists and, and pedestrians. And they include every uh, modes of the users uh, analyzing that, that facility. So a lot of the uh, level of service is based on the sidewalks, uh, whether they provide it or not, and enough, uh, enough buffer for uh, separating those uh, bicycles, pedestrian, and cars, and also roadway and traffic characteristics. Uh, obviously, more the vehicle on the road is affecting the performance of the bicycle uh, operations. Even the existence of a parking uh, and then way of the maneuvering parking is also affecting uh, the performance of the uh, bicyclists and also sometimes the pedestrians. And obviously, with a num number of lanes, uh, speed limit as well as operational speeds, uh, presence of the shoulder is important. Uh, how many conflict points? Uh, if you have uh, so many uh, alleys or, or uh, intersections along the road, more those will affect the performance of the uh, bicycle or pedestrians because more conflicts is more, more uh, dangerous. So the, the, the LOS model that I'm, I'm showing this one is uh, uh, first developed in 1996. So it's been a while. And uh, obviously, they published in the, in the TIB paper. And this is only focused on the on street, not the, the separate trails. So separate trail has a different way of measuring the performance. And then now it has been applied to so many places, over 150,000 miles. So most of the agency actually adopted this tool uh, level of service model for measuring uh, performance of the bicycle lane, on-street bicycle lane. Um, so as I mentioned here, uh, a lot of uh, variables affecting the performance of bicycles. Obviously, how close the bicycle lane or bicycles are to the vehicles. Uh, if you can separate them, this one is a mixed use, so this is not safe at all. And this one has a, a separate bike lanes, and that's a lot safer. And also how fast the cars are moving, and how many cars nearby, and uh, heavy vehicle is also affecting the performance. And then uh, pavement conditions. If you have a really rough pavement, that's not good for a bicyclist. So this is a magic equation. <clears throat> so it's a using numerical score to measure performance. And this LOS is uh, looks like an equation based on regression model type, right? Um, so people consider uh, segment aspects as uh, ABS, uh, AB segments, and then AB intersections, and then CFI, LIT conflicts are, are being used. And these have a different equations to calculate these values. So in a nutshell, that if you have a, me a magnitude based on the uh, length weighted average segment bicycle score, 
Uh, now they new HCH changed to travel time weighted. So length is uh, sort of uh, without considering uh, impact of uh, speed of slowdown. Uh, if you actually have a travel time, that actually consider length of the segment and then also the congestions or interaction with other uh, objects. Could it be different bicycles? Could it be different uh, cars in and out and affecting it? Uh, but anyhow, so you, you have a measure that's a fairly big, uh, 0.2 uh, times this measure. And also, uh, every intersection bicycle score, I'll explain that, uh, 0.03, and then conflicts per mile, is a 0.05, and then you have this 140 uh, uh, adding up. So this is the uh, uh, impact of the uh, uh, segment itself. So it's a function of the uh, volume, and PHF is a peak hour factor. <coughs> so peak hour factor is uh, uh, considering so-called the worst 15 minutes. Uh, how many of you do, do know PHF? Only have, okay. So in, in a simple way, I'm sorry? Yeah. You, do you know what it is? Yes? Okay. <laughs> it's confusing, yes. <laughs> so in a nutshell, if you have a change in uh, every 50 minutes for, for one hour, if, if everything is the same, peak hour factor is going to be one, right? Uh, if it's a smaller the peak hour factor, it's going to be more fluctuations because the equation is uh, uh, worse the 50 minutes times four over uh, hourly volume. So more variations, you have a worse the 15 minutes. And most of the traffic engineering is trying to deal with the worse the 15 minutes. So higher the PKR value, uh, it, I mean smaller the PKR value, you have more fluctuations. And also the, the heavy vehicles. So this equation basically tells that uh, all the factors of the vehicular movements are affecting the bicyclist. And again, this is a regression model type that has based on empirical data they collected and tried to establish the relationship so that we don't have to go out and collect everything, uh, just using these uh, volume data and, and so forth to, to measure the score value. And again, the, the intersection uh, is a similar way, uh, looking at the width of the, the lane and crossing distance and 50 minute volume and number of three lanes, through lanes, uh, more than through lanes, hopefully less impact on the uh, bicyclist. So using these scores, and you put those uh, 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 AB segments and the AB intersection and then C conflicts. C conflicts is a fairly straightforward per mile, how many uh, alleys and intersection conflicts are happening. And you calculate this out, and then you can measure level of service. So this is not that hard to, to get. Uh, again, uh, some of the, the bicycle is the level of service. So this facility, as you can see here, uh, no shoulder, uh, no exclusive bike lane, and the lane width is uh, not that wide, uh, and then different speed limit, and two lane undivided. Uh, peak hour factor of two is it weird? 11% trucks. Uh, fairly high trucks, and then the four complex per mile, so a lot of the unsignaled intersections and alleys. Uh, surface condition is uh, what uh, FHWA actually has, a level one through five, and uh, depends on the situations, but usually uh, default value of three is used. So this is one example of looking at the uh, level of service, and it's a C level, uh, which is not terribly bad. Uh, in part because uh, low traffic volume is helping, 1,500 vehicles per hour. Uh, so if you have a very heavy uh, flow, then cars cannot actually try to uh, weave through the bicycle list. Uh, so that's probably another factor. So you can calculate these based on these equations and then actually obtain the value as well. <coughs> so another example, uh, why the shoulder? Uh, and then uh, regular 12-foot lane, and then uh, not that high speed of 45, and again two lane undivided, uh, low uh, number of uh, low, low percentage of trucks, 
and small number of conflicts and uh, reasonable uh, surface conditions. So this will put uh, level surface B. I mean, especially this uh, 200 vehicles per hour is uh, really helpful for uh, measuring the performance of the bicycles. Uh, so some, some caveats, nothing is perfect. Uh, so model not used to predict bicycle crashes. Again, there's a non available. A lot of crash models are, are based on good data. And uh, there are so many situations of uh, bike crashes. Uh, so they don't have yet to have a reliable model, statistically reliable model. So this is not considering safety. A model based on the perceptions of safety of a typical bicyclist. Uh, so it's not really a quantitative way of looking at the uh, safety aspects of it. Uh, model also represents the typical condition uh, along the roadway segment. So it's only if looking for average. Uh, this is a very common. If you have a regression model, it's only looking for average conditions. As you know, the regression to the mean is uh, looking for mean if you have uh, uh, predictions over multiple period of time. And the slope and, and signage are not included in the model. So better signage might help. Uh, the slope is downhill is probably not good for a bicyclist. And new facility types cannot be evaluated. Uh, shared mark, lane markings or, or cycle tracks are not used for developing these models. So it's only for uh, currently existing uh, models. Maybe this will uh, help, help to understand the uh, having some better simulation model can actually evaluate these. And obviously the challenge is how do we model behavior of uh, bicyclists and pedestrians, and especially their interactions with the cars is also challenging. But more data could help to develop model and calibrate the model as well. Uh, some on the, the pedestrians. So how do we measure pedestrian level of service? Uh, most of the common way of uh, looking at this one, so it's a very safe, uh, dedicated lane, uh, probably uh, good quality. And here, a lot of pedestrians uh, moving in and out of different directions. Uh, what level of service should we give on this is uh, of interest. So the common uh, measure is based on the, the speed and spacing and delays. So level of service A is adequate spacing per, per pedestrian. And level of service E is a, a sort of a capacity level. So level of service A through F is always at capacity. So in terms of a spacing, uh, they don't seem to have a lot of spacing to move around here. Uh, in, in between is obviously level of service C. Uh, NCHRP is a National Cooperative Highway Research Program uh, research. The way this was done, similar to the Ashito activity, uh, they identify problem statements and, and people, usually state agency, uh, uh, vote for it. And then they actually find the highest uh, ranked ones. And then they put the request for proposal and they do the research on this. So this is one way of uh, developing new method and, and guidelines for entire 50 states. Uh, 370 and other research is uh, looking at these aspects of it. Uh, so it's uh, being adopted for the policy and guidelines. And sometimes the states or, or local government can adopt these before they are being adopted in the highway capacity manual, well, but which is uh, fairly rare. Most of the uh, states and agencies wanted to see others use these guidelines and, and being well adopted, then they wanted to put this into the uh, highway capacity manual, and then they start using it. And also, uh, uh, volumes are uh, vehicle volumes are key to the bike and pedestrian and quality of services. Uh, so the inputs to the, the pedestrians are uh, the vehicular tra traffic and speeds and percentage of uh, trucks because uh, they often has a longer time to stop and then causing a possible crash as well. And separation between vehicles and pedestrians are important. Uh, sometimes you have uh, curbside having another separation as well. Sometimes you don't. You only have a uh, uh, shoulder, sh shoulder. And it's, it's not safe for pedestrian walk or even bicycles to uh, travel on it. And having the buffer of uh, uh, plantings and, and barricades or uh, parked vehicles might help. Uh, 
uh, except for the park vehicles that are in and out, it's affecting another problem. And also a lot of times, uh, pedestrian uh, sidewalk is uh, filled with uh, uh, pedestrians and bicycles decide to take the roadway side to go faster, it's also another challenge. And then and how difficult to crossing, uh, especially uh, middle blocks and also the intersections. And also pedestrian density, uh, spacing wise, is a very important key factors. So the models I'm not gonna show here, but uh, the shared path is uh, uh, fairly common. Uh, so you can use the chapter 18 for using similar equations and if side uh, walk is not shared with the bikes then and pedestrian level of service is uh, worse uh, looking at these two chapters uh, pedestrian density chapter and then non density based on uh, level of service is also available so it's not only densities uh, people begin to realize that uh, just having the uh, spacing and then number of uh, pedestrians are, are uh, located is one aspect of it but what if they are actually going in different directions? Uh, the conflict is happening more. So understanding conflicts on the sidewalk is also important and other aspects of it. Uh, how fast they can move is another aspect. Uh, so it's adding more aspects of it uh, to understand the level of service. So how do we look at these data and, and make a priorities? Uh, looking at the behaviors and environment information is important. So it's a national level, state, local, and some custom levels, and usage and crashes the environment. Obviously GIS can help to look at these aspects of it. So overlaying multiple layers of the information, and you can begin to realize, uh, are there any hotspots to consider uh, making improvements? Uh, you can do this many different ways. One way to do that is uh, probably uh, calculating LOS for each segment for bicycles and pedestrians. And you have those scores along the entire segments of the roadway and could be intersections as well. And you have uh, data from other uh, aspects, crash data, usage data, land use is also important. Uh, I'm going to show you some of these later. So uh, try to uh, overlap these and making priorities. Uh, simple implementation is that maybe uh, retrofitting existing roadway with the sidewalks uh, how to develop the field, the missing segment of the sidewalk is very, very challenging. So uh, these are probably developed by uh, 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 some of the uh, developer and they are willing to put the money for creating sidewalk. And that could actually increase the, the uh, housing value as well. And some other segment of the roadway, they didn't care about these, they just built highway houses and they just sold, out, sold them. And then there's discontinuities. And how do we actually look at these? And you wanna, obviously you can go around and check everything out, but uh, you can actually see this as a GIS mapping and see where is the missing parts. And then obviously when you look at the, the LOS for the sidewalks uh, for pedestrians and bicycles, you will see the level of service are actually changing a lot. This being maybe B or A, next seven, segment being E or F, not having the sidewalk at all. So that's something you can look at uh, as a uh, uh, changing uh, seems. Uh, so this is a sort of the areas with the different uh, pedestrian crash data and uh, ones showing very high pedestrian crash, crash data and different levels of crash data. So a lot of crashes happening and you can properly identify where the problems are. Again, a number of crash is not everything. You probably want to have uh, number of pedestrian volumes which you may not have. So you probably need to go out and uh, short-term counts and, and make sure that this is uh, a, a annual data to be representative, to make a comparisons. This is urban village data with the different land use locations and we're having a lot of good uh, buffers for uh, activities and others. So you have this joining of the, the database and also you'll have this uh, having uh, village of centers have nice places and school zones are important so safety wise uh, it's interesting in the US used to be a lot of uh, children can walk to the school uh, in part because there's not many cars and fairly safe 
Uh, now, these days, in 80s and 90s, was okay, probably 90s, 2000, not many roads are safe for walk to school. So most of the kids are being uh, taken to the school by school buses uh, because there's not safe continuing uh, passage for kids to be safely walk to the school. So looking at those are also important. So some of the school buffers are available. Uh, service providers of these, uh, having uh, uh, a lot of interesting uh, school uh, social services and helping people or attractions to the activities as well. Uh, so this is a location showing that a lot of activities are being together and it will have uh, many uh, attractions for schools and, and uh, social activities and others. So this is something that we want to focus on the pedestrian-wise, activity-wise. Uh, so it will give some information. Uh, and then you could actually overlap this with the number of crashes, uh, existence of bicycle lanes, if you have a better GIS map, uh, with the Google showing a lot of the uh, uh, images of the roadway, and you can probably do without going outside as well. So in a summary, uh, when determining data needs, uh, you cannot do this without the data. And sometimes the data are available, but it's not being combined together. And sometimes those data is not good enough. You might have to go out. Uh, especially if you have a pedestrian crash data, you need to collect number of pedestrians so that you will have a reasonable rate, not just simply based on number of crashes. Uh, so it's, a, it's important to uh, work together and then set a goal for these and, and uh, because of collecting data is expensive. Uh, one way to that is uh, overlaying the maps and then you selectively collect the data, not the entire uh, counties or, or states. And a lot of the data uh, sources are there but changes. So sometimes uh, less than automobile, uh, sometimes you have to so compromise how much data do I need to get? You cannot ask for pedestrian data for entire roadway segment, uh, again. Uh, and then data can support uh, making priorities. Uh, you gotta have a decision making, not just based on speculations. Uh, it's important to have a data driven. And hopefully with the, the, connective, the connected vehicles or, or cellular data that you have on cell phones, uh, people can actually get more data on activities. Uh, number of cell phones are very similar to number of uh, uh, users nearby. And separating cars and, and pedestrians are not easy, but if you can actually look at the speeds and directions and durations, it's also possible. Uh, so in the U.S., there's a company actually selling this cellular data for providing the origin destination information and activities as well, so it's possible. So the bottom line is that level of service is a, is a very useful tool, but it's not perfect. It's missing a lot of things. Uh, maybe it's a, it's, it has to be used as a screening tool for looking at uh, where we want to investigate money. And again, HCM is not a policy. It's not mandate. Uh, similar to this LOS, that's the starting point of uh, thinking that now instead of a million segments, with these tools and ROS calculations based on the data I have, now I only need to deal with a thousand segments. And something that you can actually looking at the, some details and making decision as, a, as an engineer uh, instead of uh, looking at entire million segments. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, uh, that's pretty much it. I overspend, what oh, is 11 o'clock? Or 12. Anyway. 12. Have a good lunch. So questions before lunch? Yes. Uh, can we include more urban design aspects 